say one thing is God just opened the floor for me right in the beginning what pastor was talking about and then everything all the words that were in the worship led right up to the message that I want to share tonight um, so I was really um, amazed at the Lord because he he just works everything out all the time um, so I was talking to the Lord the other day and I said well Lord I said I knew that one day you were gonna ask me to do this I said and, and I was all for it and I was ready then but now that the time was here I was, um, I kind of got a little, I don't know if I should say worried or um, I don't know what the right word is, but I just wanted, my biggest concern was releasing the message the, the way that he wants it released and, and that I would have no part of it. So I said, Lord, I said, I'll go up there, but I'm not going up without you. I said, I'm not going up unless you give me a word. You tell me what it is that you want to say. So he woke me up at 4.30 this morning, and I got up, and I went into the next room. And Before I got up, I heard Holy Word, Spirit say, word. And I'm like, okay. So I got up, and I went to the next room. And I started waiting on the Lord. And it just started coming and coming and coming. So um, I just want to um, lift up this word to you tonight, Lord. And I just release it in your name. And I just thank you, Lord, for what you are going to do, Lord, in this coming year, and what, Lord, you are asking of us, Lord, this in this new year. And we just thank you, Lord God, that you are taking us to a higher place and that you, Lord, are equipping us and getting us there. So we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. So... <clears throat> um, when I first came to Anchorage, um, I, we were um, coming into town from the airport, and I saw this sign. It said, Welcome to Anchorage. And the Lord spoke to me right away. And he said, This is the anchor age. So this is the age that we must anchor ourselves to him because of what he is taking us into, because of um, the trials and tribulations that are coming. They're going to be a, a lot more difficult than we can even ever imagine. And Pastor has been talking to us about this, um, you know, over the, the past um, how many years, you know, and so, but we, we don't fathom it. We don't think about it. And when we do, we really can't know and we can't even begin to imagine what it's going to be like. Um, the chaos that's going to take place. Um, the needs that are going to be out there. And we as the church are the ones who are going to have to be there to meet these needs. They're not only going to be physical needs, such as food and water and shelter. They're going to be physical. They're going to be spiritual needs as well. Um, we're going to have to have discernment in a lot of areas, which means we're going to have to be equipped to do all of this, to do all of this work for the Lord that He is calling us to do. And so when I was waiting on the Lord, 
And I said, well, Lord, I said, how do we anchor ourselves to you? And he, he said that we will anchor ourselves to him through training and discipline. We are always in training. But this year specifically, the Lord wants to train us in certain areas. And he pointed out seven areas that he wants us to focus on this year. Now, some of these things um, we're all going to have to work on, but some of us are going to have to work on certain areas harder than others and, and put more work into it. And so this year is going to be um, a time where we have to initiate being anchored to the Lord because he doesn't anchor himself to us. He is the anchor. We have to anchor ourselves to him. So the seven things that um, the Lord brought to my spirit this morning were um, love, anchoring ourselves to him through love, his love, um, anchoring ourselves to him in the spirit, anchoring ourselves to him through prayer and fasting, anchoring ourselves to him by judging ourselves, anchoring ourselves to him by paying the price at any cost and, and paying the price to what he is calling us to do in this season. And anchoring ourselves to him by forgiving and through forgiveness and anchoring ourselves by putting him and his will above all else. So this is what he had put on my heart for us this year to focus on. Because <clears throat> there's a lot of things that, you know, that um, are included under, under all of this, you know, um, because of where he's taking us, we, we have to um, really get serious about it. And when he was talking to me about this, I, I could really, I could really feel the um, urgency. So, um, because he's given us these seven, um, these seven um, things, uh, I sense that he's going to use this year to fast track us and, and to catch us up in areas that we've been lacking, that we haven't really been. Um, submitting to him that we've been being lackadaisy on that we just really you know really been procrastinating about and just really basically not caring you know expecting oh yeah he's going to do it all but this year is the year he's calling us and he's pushing us and he's saying it's time because we need this and this is going to be a season that we're going to be um, proving ourselves not only to him, but we're gonna show, we're gonna see really if we do everything that he wants us to do this year, we're gonna see really where we're at and where we're lacking, and that's where he wants us to look is to ourselves. So. <clears throat> So we're going to start with the first one, love. Um, you know, as pastors taught many times, we must become love, and we must walk in love, and we must be love. And he's, you know, expressed that so many times, and, and it's one of the most vital things to our walk as we're going into this, this season. Um, Walking in love is not always easy. Um, you know, we have friends and families, acquaintances and even strangers that will, um, at one point, 
We'll do something to test our patience and our love. And in that moment, we, ha we have a decision to make. Will we react the wrong way? Or will we look to ourselves and examine ourselves when we see the anger and the hate rise up and all these certain feelings that come up when, when we're faced with um, having to love somebody who's not that lovable. <laughs> so um, in that moment, there's always the temptation to fall back into our old ways. I mean, I know there's been times when I've been with Sister Lillian somewhere and somebody will do something and it'll just, you know, it'll trigger something in me. And I'll tell her, I'll be like, man, I tell you, that person is so lucky that I am saved. <laughs> because, you know, I know if, you know, I was still the old me, I know what would happen. You know, so I, I look and I recognize that there's still that something inside me that needs to needs to go. It needs to be gone because if the enemy was to access that, because that is the opposite of what love is, and if the enemy was to access that, I'm done. You know, we open the floodgates just by that one little step of disobedience. So there's always a temptation to be pulled back into our old ways and our habits and our patterns. And that's because sometimes we, it's, you know, fear of being rejected, regardless of what it is. You know, being with friends or being with family or, you know, just even being part of a group. You know, we're always looking for that... Um, um, how do you say that? That uh, reinforcement of who we are, or something like—I um, I think you know what I mean. Though we're always looking for that. Um, yes, and. Um, That's one thing that will pull us right away from God. We need to be looking to him to remove that out of us. Because um, that rejection is, uh, that spirit of rejection is a pretty, it's a pretty wicked spirit. Um, I've dealt with it and I'm still dealing with it. So in... Um, In Matthew 5:43 it says you shall love your neighbor it says you have heard it s that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy of course we know that's the world way but i say to you love your enemies and bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust for if you love those who love you what reward do you have so I was reading this and um, you know and I was like okay Lord you're instructing us to love our enemies and sometimes the, the people who are close to us can be our worst enemy so what is it, Lord, I said, that you are doing? I said, doing in us. And, and when we look in ourselves and we see that, that place in us that we, do, we don't care about that person. You know, like, I mean, we have to be honest. Sometimes it can be, you know, our sister. Sometimes it can be, you know, 
our parents, sometimes even our kids. And I've been there. Um, my sister has persecuted me at times, deleted me on Facebook, all of that stuff. But still, I, ha I love her, even though part of me has ill feelings towards her in my soul part, I understand that, because of our background in our childhood. But I have to get past that. And so when I choose to love her and she calls and she needs prayer and she needs this and that, I'm able to say, okay, Lord, I choose to walk in love. And I choose to love her and I choose to help her. And I choose to be there for her regardless of how she treats me. And, um, and her kids, too, they, they jump on board, and, you know, and it, the, the persecution starts, oh, you're a Christian, you know, you're not supposed to act like this, you're not supposed to say this, you know, but um, I understand that they really don't know what Christianity is. They have an idea, but it's the wrong idea. So I said, okay, Lord. I said, I'm, I choose to love those who are unlovable or hard to love. I shouldn't say unlovable, hard to love. I said, so what else, Lord? And he said, um, we're also instructed to love strangers, like the homeless people or the people who are in prison. And um, in Matthew, the Lord said, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to me. So we can love through our actions. And I said, okay. I said, I understand that, Lord. I said, but Lord, I said, what? When we do things like this, I said, what does it do to us? What are you doing, like, really? And he said, I'm treating you the same way. He said that you, what you are releasing to those are, is what I'm releasing to you. So when we release forgiveness and we release love, that is what the Lord is releasing to us. And he's releasing those into the areas that we recognize in ourselves at that instant, at that moment. And um, I said, well, what about the, the homeless people? I said, how are, you, how are you doing something in us by us loving the homeless people and doing stuff? And he said, you are homeless. He said, your, your home is in the kingdom of God. And he said, but right now, he said, you're working to come home. He said, because you're on the earth, he said, and so you're, you know, you're homeless. And um, he said, and I'm there, he said, and I'm giving you food when you're hungry. He said, I'm giving you something to drink when you're thirsty. You were a stranger, and I took you in. He said, you're naked, and I clothed you. He said, you were in a prison, and I came to you. And I brought you out of that prison. And I was like, okay. I said, I get it. I said, I see it. And, um, you know, so um, as we learn to love with God's love, he can heal the deepest wounds that are inside of us that we don't even have a clue about. Um, we have triggers, but we have no idea how deep that hurt goes. Um, because we've spent years burying it, you know, years ignoring it, years denying that it's even there. So love is the one thing that um, he wants us to work on. And when I was talking to him about the homeless people, he said, 
He said, you know, he said, when you go and you, and you love them and you take them food and stuff, he said, it's so easy to go out and buy something. You know, he said, but when you take the time to go and buy the good bread, when you take the time to go and buy the good meat, and you take the time to make those sandwiches and to make them taste really good, you know, he said, that's love because you're taking the time to do it for them. You know, I mean, anybody can take a piece of bologna, slap it between th two pieces of bread and take it over there or peanut butter and jam. But you know what? These are his people. And we have to honor them the way that he sees them. And to honor them um, as the people they are. And the Lord showed me one day when I lived in Edmonton, I was praying in my room, and I said, Lord, I said, uh, you know, I, I said, show me something. So he took me in the spirit, and we went downtown, and we went on top of this building. We stood on top of this building downtown, and we looked down, and downtown is where all the homeless people are. And I said, um, what, are, what am I looking for, Lord? What am I looking at? And then all of a sudden I saw it in, in between the streets, on the sidewalks, in the back alleys, in between all the buildings where the homeless people um, hang out. I saw all these diamonds, and they were just sparkling and, and everywhere, and there was like thousands of them. And I said, Lord, I said, what is that? And he said, those are my people. He said, those are the homeless people, he said, and this is how I see them. And I was, I was able to feel the love that he had for them. And it was a love that, um, I can't even describe, but um, it was just, it was amazing. And I had another experience. I was with a friend of mine, and we were driving downtown, and he said, he was not a Christian, and he said, you know, he said, they should just take all these homeless people, he said, take them to an island, he said, and shoot them. He said, they're useless, and they give nothing to society. And when he said that, it was like this knife went right through my heart, you know, and and uh, I just felt, you know, that hurt that the Lord felt w when he said that because of what he feels for the homeless people because he knows what they've been through. He knows the struggles they've had. He knows everything about them, things that we don't know. So I was able to feel and experience God's love for the homeless. And that is how he, he um, you know, he looks at us and that's how he loves us because we, we are homeless. We agreed to leave our home and to come here until we can go back and, and be with him. So we are, we are homeless just like the homeless people. They are our equal. Um, I'm going to go through um, these things, and then at the end, I'm going to just kind of bring it all together. Um, so, the, the number two, the number two thing the Lord brought to my mind was, um, oh my gosh, eight thirty already, was um, operating in the spirit or walking in the spirit. And in these last days, we are going to be operating in the spirit more than we are going to be operating in the natural. And I was actually talking to Pastor about this the other day. And um, in order for us to, to be walking in the spirit, we have to be practicing it. We have to be focused on thinking spiritually 
instead of naturally when we're in any situation that we are in and training our mind to think like that. Um, I'm amazed at my husband because he has trained himself very well in, in that area. And um, he doesn't only do it in the spiritual, but he does it in the natural. And the other thing is why we really need to focus on learning to walk in the spirit and learning how to discern in the spirit is because in the last days when we have no Bible and we have no, no churches that we can go to in, like publicly and we're underground, how are we going to know a Christian when we see a Christian? How are we going to know what person to help? Because some, peop some people are already going to be given over to the devil. We have to be able to spiritually discern and depend on the Lord and hear him if we are going to know who to help, who to trust, and who to um, reveal who we are as well. They have to know, they have to be walking in the same spirit that we are in, in those times. Um, you know, we have to be able to discern whether or not we're being drawn into a trap because the enemy is going to be out there and he's going to be after us. So we have to really um, look at that and everything that we do, and um, and we have we have to know the word. We have to study the word, and we have to know um, our authority, and it, all those spiritual gifts that the Lord, you know, has given us. We have to learn how to use them. We have to learn how to access them, and we have to start practicing them on a daily basis. Um, so number three, um, oh, before I go on, um, you know, Matthew 24 says, take heed that no one deceives you. And a lot of the scriptures that I, I got are from Matthew. Um, and, and it was just amazing how the Lord just opened this up to me. So number three is we have to anchor ourselves to him through prayer and fasting. You know, um, Jesus prayed. We see it everywhere in the Bible. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. And I will be the first one to say, you know what, sometimes I get tired of praying. You know, and, and I just be honest with the Lord and I say, Lord, you know, I said, I'm tired, you know. I have to go and pray, but you know what, I don't feel like praying. And uh, part of me, you know, it doesn't want to pray, but I'm going to go, and I force myself, and I say I'm going to go. And um, we do so. We do a lot of praying. We pray for Alaska. We pray for Israel. We pray for our president. And the Lord was so gracious. Um, the other day I got something in the mail. I don't know, I haven't really said anything to anybody about this, but I'm just going to share this. Um, I think it was about three months ago the Lord put it on my heart to write a letter to the president. So I did. I wrote a letter to him. A letter to encourage him to stand and to keep doing what he's doing. And... Um, I told him, you know, that we were just a small church in Anchorage, but that we were praying for him 24-7, that we had his back in prayer, and that we would keep on praying for him no matter how long the Lord told us to or wanted us to. If it was two years, three years, however long, I told him, I said, we will continue praying for him. And I didn't really expect anything in, anything back. Um, I actually wondered if he even got the letter. But he did, and we got a letter in the mail yesterday, 
uh, day before yesterday. And um, he thanked us for praying for him. And, and it was, it was a, um, you know, it was a short letter, but he was very thankful. And um, um, he said he was really encouraged and, and things like that. So um, the Lord let me know that, you know, he got the letter and that we are, you know, we have his back. So our prayers are being answered. And so I was really, um, I was really excited about that, and I was actually really happy about it. And, and um, you know, to to for, to know that we are serving the Lord that way through prayer, and that there, you know, everything that's being that we're praying for is is coming forth. So the next thing I'm looking forward to now is these elections that are coming up you know, in, in, in Anchorage, because that is part of our prayer, as you know, is that our state return, you know, to the, the Republicans. So I'm expecting and anticipating good things from that. Um, you know, so um, we have to really be um, watchful that we... Um, we don't fall into um, complacency with our prayer. And, um, you know, Jesus was all alone. He didn't have no friend. He had nobody that he could talk to except the Father. He had nobody who could say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to come and help you, and I'm going to come and pray with you. Everybody fell asleep on him, you know, or they didn't understand why he prayed so much. But... I can't remember what scripture that is, but it says, um, how, can, how can one move the hand of God lest he pray? So we are going to have to pray and, and keep on praying and keep practicing and, and letting that prayer work in us because what we are praying for other people, for this state, for our government, for Israel, all those things, are being sown back into our lives and we're going to reap those things in the in the times that um, that are coming so we we have to really um, know that what we are sowing right now is what we are going to reap in the days to come and we are going to need it um, but it's not only that, all the things that we're going to have to deal with, like sometimes we're going to have to deal with sickness. People are going to be sick and have no medicine. We're going to have to know how to pray. We're going to have to know our authority. We're going to have to know how to deal with this stuff spiritually. So we need to really, um, we need to really pray and, and, um, not let the enemy come in and, and distract us and um, pull us away from our prayer and convince us that our prayer is not working or to convince us that, you know what, we don't need to pray. The others are praying. We have to, no matter what. Other people are depending on us in the days to come, even we have the weight of the world on our shoulders. That's just the truth about it. Because it says in Matthew twenty one twenty two, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive them. So when we are walking in, in the things of the Spirit and walking in our authority, when we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, I'm asking this, in your name will you, you know we don't have to question if he'll do it because he will do it we have to get there we have to get to that place where we know that our prayer is going to be answered you know sometimes it's going to be quick sometimes it's going to have to wait but still Um, number three, number four, um, 
Judging ourselves is the fourth one. I, I love this one. Um, the, the one thing that comes to mind about this, this one is, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie The Shack or read the book, but when, when Holy Spirit took that guy and put him on the mercy seat and told him to judge his daughter's murderer, he saw that guy's life from beginning to end, from when he was a child. And that guy got beat up by his dad. You know, he was, um, he was abused physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. You know, so everything that he did to that little girl when he murdered her is what he learned growing up. And so the father of the child when he was, you know, um, going to judge this guy, he also had to look at his own daughters and his kids because um, his kids had, you know, um, sins in their life. So he had to, the same thing that he judged that guy, he had to judge his own kids with, and he couldn't do it. So we have to be very careful, you know, about judging people in, in, in the coming days because we have no idea what they've been through. And unless, you know, Holy Spirit or the Lord reveals it to us, then we will know how to deal with them. But this is something that we have to also do this year, you know, is constantly, constantly judge ourselves look at ourselves in every situation no matter what it is no matter how small we have to judge ourselves otherwise we will not be able to discern things properly. We'll not be able to even discern our own self properly. Um, number five is um, paying, the, paying the price. Everything that we do is going to cost us. In one way or the other, when we serve the Lord, it will cost us. It doesn't matter. Just like when you're making sandwiches for the homeless people, it's going to cost you money to go buy that bread. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you your time. It's going to cost you your gas. Serving the Lord is going to cost us. And we have to be willing to pay that price, and we have to be willing um, to put everything else aside. I remember one week, um, it was a couple weeks ago, and um, as you guys know, I, I make native crafts and I sell them. So this one week, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't think that I had, you know, enough and stuff, and I was just really wanting, needing the time to make these crafts. And my husband was like, okay, let's go here. And I'm like, okay. And I was, you know, and some days I was tired. And then he'd say, you know, well, let's go to a movie. And I think that week we went to two movies. And I'm like, okay. So I kept putting everything that I wanted to do, I kept putting it off. And I, I kept putting it last and not getting it, not getting it done, not doing it. And the Lord was talking to me that week. And he said, this is how I need my people to be. He said, yes, I have called you and I have told you make some crafts, you know, and, and minister to the people and do this and do that. He said, but, he said, first and foremost, he said, I have called you to minister to your family and to your husband. And I said, yes, Lord. So all that week, I put everything off. Everything that I wanted to do, didn't matter what it was, I put everything off, and I did what my husband wanted to do all that week. <clears throat> 
and of course my flesh was you know not liking it but my spirit was stronger than my flesh praise the lord <laughs> you know and i knew what it was doing to my my flesh and i was like yes let's get it done so you know we have to be willing to pay the price no matter what the lord asks us to do because in the times that we go we're going in he is going to ask us at times to walk right into the enemy's camp and we have to be prepared to do that do we want to do that i do you know but am i ready no i'm not ready i haven't been practicing this stuff consistently in my life and i would just the enemy would just like take me out easy um You know, and in Samuel 2, 24, 24, it says, you know, David spoke and he said, no, but I will surely buy it from you. This was when he was looking to buy that land. And um, and he said, um, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with with." that which costs me nothing. And um, in Luke 14, 28, it says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first to count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? And in Luke 14, 31, Or what king going to make war against other kings does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And it's the same thing. Are we ready spiritually to go into battle? We have to look at our love. We have to judge ourselves. You know, we have to um, look at ourselves in our spiritual life. Like, are we walking in the spirit? Are we practicing and using our authority? We have to be practicing it. I'm at the market, and some days, you know, the clouds are coming over, and it's going to rain. And the forecast says it's going to rain. And I'm like, no. And I go out there, and I don't care if, you know, people see me. Because I, I, don't, I don't care. Because I'm, I'm there to, to learn and practice my authority. And I'll go out, and I'll stand up there, and I'll speak to the clouds, and I'll speak to the weather. And I'll say, you will not rain in Jesus' name. I said, I don't care if you rain before the, the market. But you're not going to rain during the market. You can rain after the market. Sure enough, that day, 2 o'clock, it started raining when the market was over. My neighbor guy, he's a Christian. And he's always joking around now. He, and he's saying, yeah, he goes, I know you got a direct line to the man upstairs. And, you know, we've had a great summer all, all summer at the market. But I practice that. When it comes to sickness or anything, if I'm getting sick or if I know a pastor's getting sick or my son... If I see that, the Lord spoke to me years ago and he said, no sickness, illness, or disease shall touch you or your house. So when that happens, I'm like right there and I'm on that. And I practice it all the time. And that's what we have to do. It doesn't matter. You know, the people are in our house. We have authority in our house and we can call that sickness to death in our house. So we have to practice that because in the days to come, we're going to have to be dealing with this kind of stuff. And there's going to be no medicine. There's going to be nothing. And these people are going to be depending on us. So, um, number six, um, forgiveness and unforgiveness. It says in Matthew six fourteen, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, this includes also financial debts. You know, I mean, I asked my son earlier, I said, look up trespass and what does that mean? And, it, and um, he said in the summarized version is, you know, when somebody, you know, comes unauthorized to come in onto your property or into your space or, or something like that. Anyways, you know, they, they trespass on, on your, you know, your turf. And, um, and then the scripture says, how many times, Lord, should I forgive my, is it my brother, right? Seven times. 
And the Lord said seven times seven. Because we all know what unforgiveness does. It, it, it harbors um, ill will, bitterness, all of that stuff. And all that stuff is what the enemy can access in us. You know, so we have to constantly be forgiving, 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 not just, um, and then we, then we have to even self-examination, say, okay, I forgive you, but do we, have we really done it in our heart? Have we just spoken it, just, you know, nonchalantly and, and not really believed it? That's a, that's a pretty heavy duty one because um, us being here native and, and being black, African American, you know, we, both of our races have been subject to, um, to horrendous treatment by, uh, by um, I'm just, I just gotta say it, by white people. And I said to my husband one day, years ago, I can't remember, a couple of years, and I said, I said, why, I said, was it that it was the white people who dominated over the native people and it was white people who dominated over the black people? I said, why was it like that, you know, like in our, our continent? And he said, because the devil needs, needed, um, you know, needed to use somebody and he just chose the white people, you know, and, and, um, I can honestly say, and for Native people, I don't care who you are, if you are Native, you are racist against white people. You may not say that you are, but in your heart, when something happens and a trigger happens, all of a sudden now you're just like, you know, you're on, on the, on the, on the um, defensive now. And, and it's, you know, towards a white people. And it's that thing, it's that, um, it's that racism thing, right? It comes back and it's like, you know, well, if you did this to our people and you did that, you know, and this and that and, and all of that stuff. And so we have to really watch that and, and we have to get rid of that because that is so seated within us. And we cannot help anybody spiritually or naturally with that kind of, um, spirit within us, unforgiveness. And I, and I see it, you know, it's, it's hidden when you're out in the public, but when you go to a reserve or you go someplace else, they're talking about it out loud. Oh yeah, those white people taking our land again, those white people, you know, coming and drilling on our land and taking our oil and our gas and not giving us anything. It comes out, but you just don't hear it out in the public because you know what? That spirit is very sneaky, and you know, native people don't want to look bad, <laughs> you know, and that's just the way that it is. But we can't, we we can't be like that because we're going to help people who are going to be. They're going to be mean to us, and they're going to you know they're going to overstep their boundaries with us, and through love and our forgiveness, is what's going to help them but we're not gonna be able to help them unless we are able to forgive them and forgive ourselves for the racism that we have inside and the animosity that we have towards the white race. Um, number seven is, um, and the last one, is um, putting Jesus and his will above all else, including ourselves. No matter how small the request, we have to put his will before ours. Um, there was um, a situation um, um, I can't even remember what year it was maybe 2010 um, I had to put Jesus's will before mine when it came to my son and it was one of the hardest things that I had to do 
Um, but I like I, I had to do it um, in other areas too, like in, in my area of my work and finance, finances and all this. But the hardest one was when it came to my son. Because at that time, my son was a, um, he was not saved, and he was in the bar, and he was playing pool. He was a really good pool player, and he was going to Las Vegas, and he was, um, you know, he was pretty up there in, in the pool business. And, uh, and he was playing pool around town and being in the bars and stuff like that and getting involved with drug dealers, and then he started selling drugs, and, and um, he started doing drugs, and, and he got into some trouble with the drug dealer, and um, had, you know, owed the drug dealer a bill. And, you know, he came to me and he's like, Mom, you know, she's going to beat me up and all this and that. And he's threatening to kill me and all this. And and um, I love my son. And I don't want anything bad to happen to him. So I believe that if I helped him, he was going to quit. So I helped him. And he didn't. It just happened all over again. And... Um, he came, he came to me one night and, and he said, Mom, he said, I owe the drug dealer money again. And he said, and he's looking for me. He said, he's got guys all over the place looking for me, he said. And, and he, when he came to my house, he was like literally, you know, peeking in the windows and stuff. And so I brought him in and, um, and he said, Mom, you have to help me. You have to help me. And uh, the Lord spoke to me and he said, no. He said, you can't help him. And I said, Lord, I said, but I know this guy I said he's going he's gonna to hurt him pretty bad, if not maybe even kill him. And the Lord said, no. He said, you, you can't help him. He said, give him to me. He said, trust me. So I had to put the Lord's will ahead of mine as much as it hurt me and as much as it, as scared as I was. And um, so... I said, okay. And I told my son, I said, I can't help you. I said, you have to leave. And um, so he kind of got a little bit mad and he left. And then that night, that evening, that drug dealer called me and he was looking for my son. And I know this guy. He's a family guy. And um, he called me. And so when I was on the phone, Holy Spirit rose up in me and reminded me of my authority and who I was and um, he said you call the shots and I said okay so he asked me go, he asked me for my son and I said no he's not here and he said do you know where he is and I said no he said do you know what's going on and I said yeah I do I said but you listen here I said you will not break his bones I said you will not kill him I said and you will not bring it to my complex I said and after this I said you will leave him alone and you will have nothing to do with him and I knew that I was speaking to that demon I wasn't speaking to the drug that I was speaking to the demon that was inside of him and I said do you understand and he said yes I said okay bye so I hung up so I knew that night my son was going to have to go through a hard trial <laughs> A hard thing and it was even harder on me but I was on my knees all night in my living room and I was praying and um, um, the next morning my son came over and he was all beat up and, and um, he said he might have to get um, plastic surgery on his face because he said the doctor thinks he broke his cheek and I said no I said your bones are not broken but he didn't understand because he d wasn't saved, so he didn't understand spiritual things. And, and I told him, I said, it's not broken. So then after that, the Lord honored, honored me, and he honored my son. My son um, quit playing pool. My son quit hanging out at that bar. My son quit having anything to do with the drug dealer. And the Lord even shut down that bar that was like in our community where my, my son was hanging out and um, gave my son a good job. And now to this day, my son has been at that job going on 10 years, you know, and he just really looked after, after my, my son and my son has a, um, 
a girlfriend now and they have a baby and they've got a good life and he's working really hard to look after his family and so um, that's the first time I ever shared that but I had to put God's will ahead of mine because God knows you know what what can, he can do when we submit to him you know even when it comes to our kids so it doesn't matter what it is you know there's um you know um submitting to our husband or submitting to the lord in our finances or submitting to the lord in disciplining our kids or submitting to the lord in um our job you know taking a less paying job it doesn't matter what it is there's always a purpose for what what he asked why he asked us to do that and so in these coming days we have to really really be practicing to do all of these things and through through our submission to the Lord and and practicing this and walking this out in this in this next year the Lord is going to be able to do amazing things in us and change us and fast track us and get us to the place that we need to be because of our laziness and because of our lack of honoring him the way that we should have been honoring him and because of our um, lack of love for him. So um, when we practice these things, we are deactivating our will. We are learning to be obedient. We are increasing our faith level. We are enhancing our spiritual senses. We are becoming slaves to the master. We are causing our old man to die at a faster rate. Our authority level increases. And we help destroy those hindrances in us such as unbelief, fear, doubt, slothfulness, all those things that are stopping us from getting ahead. And um, we have to continue doing it until we are literally walking and operating constantly in the spirit where we are sensitive to spiritual things and automatically deal with them in the spirit. It says in Matthew 15, 13, it says, Every plant which my Heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. And this is the only way that he can uproot it, is if we come in agreement with him and we submit to him and we do all of these things this year. He can uproot a whole lot of stuff in us this year, and this is what he's wanting us to do. So in all, all in all is he is calling us to the cross. You know, we, we die daily. But this year is a year that we must anchor ourselves to him. Through this type of training, we will be anchored in him and to him through the cross. We will stand for his righteousness at any cost. We will die without flinching. We will not fear anything. We will glorify God. We will fight to the death, and we will not fear death. We will not turn to the left or to the right. We will just keep on going and do what the Lord asks us to do without question, without doubt, without fear. We will endure going and going, fighting and fighting, and we will not stop. Because when we are anchored in him, we will not be moved. So this is the word of the Lord to us in this season. And... Um, I look forward to um, this time next year and to see what he has done in us and 
what he's revealed in us, our strengths and our weaknesses. And um, I'm looking forward to how much slothfulness he's going to get rid of in us and procrastination. So praise the Lord for what he's doing. And um, I just thank you for um, being here and hearing the word that the Lord has given me to share.